So good morning, everyone, and welcome to Parents and Family Weekend. Um, we are Lisa and Tim Harkness, and we have the honor of co-chairing the Parents, uh, the Tufts Parents Leadership Council. And when I look out and see so many of you here, I think about our first time here and how exciting it is to see where your children are at school. And we come every year. So whether it's your first time or your 15th, it's always a special weekend. So in case you don't know, the Parents Leadership Council works together in concert with the Tufts Parents Giving Program. Uh, and that's in the Tufts Parents Giving Pro Program is the host of this fabulous weekend. Uh, and the purpose is to enhance the student experience through engagement and philanthropy from all of us who are so proud to send our children to Tufts. So as we experience the wonderful faculty, and I know many of you have just come from meeting with our great faculty, the incredible music and um, performance groups, and the talented student athletes throughout the weekend, we remember what inspires us to support Tufts' mission with our philanthropy. Um, our first Parents Weekend was in 2017, uh, when our daughter Katie arrived at Tufts, and we didn't go to Tufts, so we did not know what an experience it would be to become a jumbo. And now we totally feel like we're a jumbo. She's now in graduate school in London and, uh, and with a bunch of other jumbos. And we are so honored to be back here to welcome you all now uh, and our daughter Caroline is a sophomore. So another jumbo in the family, continuing our connection to this wonderful school. So before um, we introduce President Kumar, um, two housekeeping notes. First, can you silence your cell phones and also take note of the exits in front and behind you? It's my honor to uh, introduce President Kumar. Sunil Kumar is a 14th president of Tufts University and assumed office on July 1st, 2023. He also serves as a professor in the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering at Tufts University's School of Engineering. Prior to arriving at Tufts, he previously served as provost of John Hopkins University, dean of the Booth School of Business at the University of Chicago, and as a faculty member at the Stanford Graduate School of Business. At Tufts, President Kumar is strongly committed to preserving and enhancing the emphasis on a liberal arts undergraduate education within a tight-knit and student-centered environment. He is also focused on enabling conditions that foster cutting-edge teaching and world-class research that serves both national and global interests through Tufts' many graduate and professional schools. Born and raised in India, President Kumar's uh, bachelor and master's degrees were from Mangalore University and the Indian U Institute of Science, respectively, before receiving his PhD in electrical engineering from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Please join us in giving President Kumar a big jumbo welcome. Thank you, Lisa and Tim. And for people standing in the back, there are few uh, uh, seats here. So thank you for your warm introduction and for your leadership. Uh, for this uh, wonderful weekend. Parents and families, welcome and thank you for joining us. Whether you're visiting from as close as a few streets away or as far as Uganda and Vietnam or from a truly foreign country like New Jersey. No, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm delighted to be here for my first Parents and Family Weekend. Let me first say that these are difficult times and the campus is no different. I'm glad that parents and families are here during this weekend because this is a time when some of our students may need you the most. On our part, the university is committed to ensuring that all our students not only feel safe, but are warmly welcomed into the Jumbo family. Tufts is a special place, and I don't say that lightly. I'm an engineer and I can provide objective evidence of its special nature. <laughs> it has the feel of a small liberal arts college, and yet it is a major research university. It is, but most importantly, it's filled with jumbos. 
accomplished yet understated, kind and helpful. I love being here. Over the weekend, I hope you will, and have already to some extent sampled the buffet that is available from available to your student. And as you can tell from my waistline, my metaphors tend to be of the culinary variety. <laughs> Today you will have the opportunity to attend a few lectures by our wonderfully accomplished and diverse faculty from areas ranging from aging to media to design to DEIJ. We also have several teams competing on the campus today. I encourage you to stop by and cheer our field hockey, volleyball, men's and women's soccer, and football teams today. And this afternoon, please be sure to stop by the Avenue of the Arts to enjoy some delicious fall treats and enjoy performances by our outstanding and talented students. And while the events are on our Medford Somerville campus, neither you nor your students should miss an opportunity to visit our other campuses, Chinatown, Fenway, and Grafton. Yes, Grafton is far away, but it has puppies. <laughs> the breadth of the buffet at Tufts is indeed impressive, and I hope your student takes the maximum advantage of it. In my inauguration address last week, I highlighted five broad themes that are of particular importance to me as we begin to light the way forward in our journey towards Tufts' futures. So for the freshman parents in the audience, in addition to Jumbo, light on the hill is the other thing that you will hear frequently and often. And it goes back to the, our founding uh, in 1852 when there's a wonderfully um, long and impossible to read book on the history, which I strongly recommend. <laughs> Educating responsible leaders for tomorrow. It's the first of my pillars. It's the goal of every university, but my leadership team and I need to work to define what it means at Tufts. Providing transformative experiences. This is in fact part of the topic that Dean Lee will, will uh, present in a little bit, but it's also embedded in our mission statement. But what do we mean by transformative at Tufts? And how do we ex operationalize these experiences in practice? Expanding our research footprint. How do we grow our research enterprise, but remain uniquely and distinctively impactful? Four, broadening our definition of what it means to be a student. How do we increase access and opportunity for a Tufts education to an even more diverse student body and non-traditional set of students? And finally, giving back to the community and society. How do we both educate our students to give back to society and also perform the kind of research that serves the national and global interest? In order to make any meaningful headway on these broad themes and to make progress for the next transformative decade at Tufts, investing in people, the students, faculty, staff, and alumni who make up our cherished community, and investing in our plant, the campuses, buildings, dorms, and facilities where we study, work, and live and, live and play will be essential and will be a priority for me. As I said, uh, Dean Lee will talk a little bit more about transformative experiences, so I don't want to steal his thunder. However, for me, the undergraduate experience, when it's transformative, should be one of broad exploration, of deep self-discovery, through which our students identify their passions and purpose. But it's also a time when they build lifelong friendships, and most importantly, are happy. And to that end, some of you may have seen in my matriculation speech, I suggested that we should have events organized by our students 
that are clean, safe, and have no ostensible purpose. Uh, I got one of them. Uh, it involves Taylor Swift and costs a lot of money. <laughs> I'll leave you to find out the details from your student. With leaders like Dean Lee, we will work to provide your students with a broad range of opportunities, both curricular and extracurricular, to strengthen the student community even further and to help our students launch on purposeful careers through our career center and other resources. Investing in these and making them even more robust will be a priority. I'm energized by the path that lies ahead, and I look forward to getting to work and making Tufts, now our special place, even better. Now, the main reason I was asked to come here was so that I could introduce my boss. <laughs> uh, I am a professor in engineering, and therefore, uh, you know, in, at, in the I'm hoping unlikely event that I go, I go back to being a professor in engineering. <laughs> I better keep him happy. So here goes. Dean Lee has had a long and distinguished career at Tufts, having joined the university in 2002 as an assistant professor, be, being named the chair of chemical and biological engineering in 2012, and was appointed dean two years ago. He is an accomplished scholar with many honors, like the election as a fellow of the American Institute of Medical and Biological Engineering. He's also a dedicated teacher, and this is one of the defining characteristics of faculty members at Tufts. He is the winner of the Tufts University Graduate Teaching and Mentoring Award. His research interests are in systems biology, metabolomics, and the microbiome, he seeks to translate these basic insights and technologies that he does in his research into applications leading to engineering practice and meaningful health outcomes and thus giving back to society. He's particularly interested in discovering therapeutic and diagnostic targets for metabolic diseases like obesity. Dean Lee has an ambitious plan for the School of Engineering that will fulfill its twofold mission of educating students and advancing knowledge for the benefit of mankind even better, even better. So please join me in welcoming Dean Kyung Bum Lee. Thank you, President Kumar. And, uh, in case you didn't know, he was kidding about me being his boss. <laughs> I just want to make that very clear. Um, I, I, you know, I thank you, President Kumar, for the kind introductions. Uh, I feel like uh, expectations are set a little too high. I'm going to try to see if I can do my best to meet to some of those expectations. So good morning, uh, parents, family, students. Uh, I do have some comments for your students, so I'm glad to see students in the audience as well, despite the fact that it's pretty early for college students on a Saturday morning. Um, as you can see, the title of my talk is The Expectations We Have for a Transformative Experience at Tufts. Uh, but you see a subtitle also called My Ode to Tufts. Um, you may be wondering what's one got to do with the other. What I hope to do over the next half hour or so is to uh, convince you that really they're one and the same thing uh, for me, uh, that my experience here is also my ode to this institution. Um, I may have to meander somewhat, because uh, what I'd like to do is tell you a few stories about uh, people I've interacted with, uh, students, colleagues, uh, who've inspired me uh, to the very best I can, and I hope that these stories will connect uh, to the theme I have about having a transformative experience at Tufts. A few months ago, um, I was at an event celebrating the retirement of a colleague. Uh, we do that when someone retires, we get together for dinner and talk about all the successes and relationships we've had. At the very event, I also ran into my PhD advisor, who was a good friend of my colleague who retired. I hadn't seen him in a while, 
So uh, glad to catch up. He asked me how I was doing. Uh, I was liking my new role as dean. And then, unsolicited, uh, he gave me some advice. Um, I haven't been in his lab in 21 years, uh, but one of the things that endure is very special about relationships between advisor and students that, that it doesn't matter. You know, I could have as many gray hairs as I like or don't like. Um, once a student, you know, he will always look at me as his student. And one of the things that professors like to do um, in terms of responses is, I'm gonna give you a piece of advice. <laughs> the other thing professors like to do when a student asks them questions, and students you may have already figured this out, is what do you think? <laughs> it turns out those two staples of professor's life actually gets them quite far. <laughs> and my advisor has written those two things all the way to the National Academy. So it worked for him. Um, so what advice did it give me? He said, be authentic. Be authentic if you want to be effective. People will see right through you if you're not being authentic, but if you are, it'll shine forth to everyone will see it. He had a way with words also. I laughed because he gave me uh, unsolicited advice um, and I had no idea what he was talking about. <laughs> like, how is that even useful? Be authentic. Of course, I'm gonna be genuine when I talk to people, interact with people. Um, but then when Gina asked me to give this speech to DeRay, and I was having a hard time figuring out what I should say, I kept circling back to the advice you gave me about being authentic. And it turns out that actually helped me out a great deal. So I was a little annoyed when I realized that. <laughs> it's kind of like admitting your parents are right about something. And I think everyone in the room knows, it's like, for example, picking a college. Maybe they were right after all. Um, and I had a lot of different ideas about what I wanted to say. You know, one idea I had was that I could talk to you about some of the research we do in the School of Engineering. Um, the impact of the work our faculty and students are doing to address some of the most pressing challenges of our time in society. We have faculty and students uh, developing smart membranes that can help treat wastewater to not only remove bacteria and large particulates, but also individual chemicals. As we have greater and greater chemical contaminations with biological activities, this becomes more and more important to do in a safe and efficient manner. We have research that allows us to drive new materials, discover new materials that can allow you to preserve vaccines and other medicines without having to do refrigeration. You can imagine the reach of those vaccines in parts of the world where refrigeration is not trivial. We have faculty who grow meat in the labs to complement more traditional agriculture, which have very, very large and sometimes harmful environmental footprint. So these efforts do allow us help address real challenges in the world today, from climate change to global health, to sustainable food production. So that was one idea I had to talk to you about. Put that aside. Um, another I had was talk to you about the innovative teaching we do. Uh, for example, talk about courses like sci-fi and biotechnology. I wonder if anyone here has taken the class. Wow. <laughs> I thought at least one person might be. Well, actually that's good, because then I can tell you what the class is about and no one's gonna know. <laughs> um, it, it, it tries to introduce modern biotechnology concepts by using popular films like Jurassic Park and Gattaca as a vehicle to have a touch point that students can relate to in, in the popular imagination, but then use that as a window to open up stories about how science is done. And really importantly, and I think this is one of the distinguished characters of our classes, connected to other societal issues around ethics. When is it okay? When is it not okay to do these experiments? What are some of the consequences far beyond technology? So I could have talked to you about that. I'll put that aside too. Um, a third option was actually to talk to you about uh, some of my own research, but I feel like I'm supposed to make you happy, not torture you. So I put that aside too. Um, 
Despite the fact that that combination of innovative teaching and research is, I think, very unique and distinctive for Tufts, uh, they're not the only things that, for me, have made this place special. A truly special place, as Professor uh, Kumar, President Kumar has told you about Tufts. What has made this institution special to me have been the relationships I had with students and faculty colleagues who have, through their words and actions, gifted me with new paths to walk uh, that have not otherwise been able to walk on my own. So what I'd like to do for the remainder of today is share some of the stories I had with particular students. Um, I'm gonna name them. So if actually you are here in the audience, because now you are old enough to, to have uh, children of your own, um, I may embarrass you, but I hope you're not. So the first story is about Mark Walker. Um, so that's, that's the guy pictured on the screen, top left, uh, my top left, uh, looking at this computer screen. So probably all you saw your top left too. So Mark um, studied chemical engineering and computer science. You heard from uh, President Kumar's introduction that I'm a professor of chemical engineering. I haven't had him in class yet, but you know, I, probably, I eventually did. Uh, but this is before he took any of my classes. Uh, he, he showed up one day to my office. Uh, our practice at Tuft is have doors open when we're in the office and don't have another meeting. So students walk in. So he walked in and let me know if he was interested in doing some research uh, that could be at the interface of his two majors, chemical engineering and computer science. He heard about some of the work we're doing um, in, in, in modeling cell metabolism as a, a network of chemical reactions. And he felt that could be potentially a good fit. Uh, he was very smart, very earnest. Also, I like the fact that he had read one of my papers. So a tip to you students. Uh, professors are always flattered if someone actually knows about something they've done in the past. So uh, I liked Mark right away. Um, so we agreed to work together. He uh, just spent some time in the lab over the summer, helped me build some tools to visualize reaction networks. Um, but as I was working with him, I, it dawned on me that really, it's a confession time, I'm not a computer scientist. Uh, I, I don't think I have that depth of knowledge and, and algorithms to really guide his interest in that discipline. Luckily for me, uh, Mark necessarily didn't need that from me. He was taking classes in computer science, some advanced classes. And um, one of the classes he was taking, he came across a professor, uh, my good friend and colleague, Soa Hasun, who's pictured on the next row. Um, and he said, you know, I think you should work with her. And she said the same thing to her. You should work with them. You guys have a lot of common interests. So actually, Mark brought us together. Uh, my collaboration that still goes on today, 15 years later with Soha, would not have started and existed without a student coming to me and her and telling us that, you know, I know something a bit about both of your work. There's a good synergy here. You should really do something together. And that has launched my career in a different direction than without Mark's insight and, and reaching out to me. Um, the student pictured on the lower left, that's Gotham Strahan. He is a PhD student that Soha and I co-advised. And that student experience probably would not also have existed without Mark's input to me and Soha. And through to some of the work that Mark has done in terms of modeling in a very probabilistic way, uh, of sampling different spaces. Uh, this is what we do in network science. We need to traverse many, many different paths of one part of the network to another. As the networks get larger and larger, that becomes a very difficult task, especially if you were just to experiment on it. Um, some of the work that Soa and I are able to do together through Gotham's efforts allowed us to sample the space in a very efficient manner, so we could not just do a competition and experimentation separately, but do it together. So I, I lied a little bit, I have to subject to some of the stuff I've done, uh, just to give you some context. Um, you know, this is a schematic that shows how you can go from one molecule, where's my pointer? I got it. Thank you. 
So using the computational tools that Mark developed, we're able to actually go from one chemical, it's called tryptophan, it's an amino acid, people get it through the diet, to another chemical called endothreacetic acid, there are some chemical reactions that are facilitated by bacteria in your gut. If you combine all the reactions going on in by different species of bacteria living in your digestive tract versus everything going on in the human body, there are thousands and thousands of reactions. And trying to find the path between one chemical to another that way, just, just kind of going at it one at a time, it's impossible. Um, we're able to find some of these new chemicals because of the computational work that Mark and then Gotham and Soa and I were able to do together. We found this interesting compound. We realized it had an interesting structure, biological activity. Um, and then we start screening for activities, we're excited about what it might be able to do. And so uh, we managed to actually find some applications in terms of treating metabolic diseases, which is of interest to, to my lab. Uh, the, the picture you're seeing is a, a, a histology section of a liver from a mouse who has been raised on what we call a, a Western diet. Uh, that's a technical term for lots of sugar, lots of fat. <laughs> um, and what you see here is a section of a healthy liver. This is, is a liver that results after some weeks of Western diet feeding. Um, you can sort of see this white oval object. There was a fat droplets within the cells of your liver. Um, that's not a good thing results in inflammation, eventually loss of function, and sometimes even failure and other worst outcomes. As we increase the dose of the chemical we found in the bacteria in the digestive tract, you can sort of see how that normalizes then at a certain enough you know, dose, um, the thing looks almost healthy. And there's lots of biological reasons why the bacteria make some of these chemicals. Uh, they do need to coexist in the environment that does not elicit a lot of a immune reaction from the body. So there's a symbiosis between the bacteria and the human body. There's mutual benefit for bacteria to generate molecules that could be protective to humans. Also benefit for bacteria to keep the inflammation and immune reaction down because those things eventually tend to come after the bacteria. So there are interesting chemicals that are resonant in the digestive tract, you can find and possibly use as a very safe way to treat people with metabolic diseases. So you've lost the ability to make these chemicals because your diet has eliminated this bacteria, or you have taken antibiotics, and that killed the bacteria for, for different reasons as you're treating some other disease. So this is the kind of direction I was able to take my research towards. I don't think that would have been possible without an undergraduate student showing up in my office his sophomore year and saying, can I work with you and have these ideas for you to work with somebody else at Tufts? So that's the story of Mark. Um, the next story I want to tell you about is, is Mike, uh, his picture here. And even though I met Mike through a similar experience as Mark's, uh, he was a student in the department, was interested in doing some research, uh, the point of this story is a little bit different. Mike. Uh, similar to Mark, I had an interest in doing some research in biotechnology space, uh, came to my office. By the way, in case you're wondering, so students at Tufts just got to show up to the professor's office and say, can I work with you? It's, it may seem that way to you, and actually that's because that is the case, that that's what they do. Uh, we welcome that. Um, it turns out that Gautam, uh, the student that Soha and I co-advise, was very much interested in mentoring students of his own as a graduate student. We encourage that as well. So I connected Mike and Gotham, and they immediately bonded and did some really great science together and see the title of a, a journal paper they published together as co-authors uh, with me and Sarah. But that's not the point of the story here. The point of this story is about something called ABET. Uh, I don't know how many of you are familiar with ABET. Uh, it stands for the Accreditation Board of um, Engineering and Technology Incorporated. Uh, in, a, in a nutshell, it's like a guild. Um, they they uh, go around the country and, and look at the health of a curriculum of different engineering school programs and evaluate them and then certify that the program is healthy. And if you pass, uh, they leave you alone for six years. Uh, it so happens that actually I will have them visit Tufts Engineering in about two weeks or so. Um, so the reason I mentioned this piece is because 
around the time Mike joined the lab, I had become the interim chair of the department. Uh, you know, my dean asked me, could you do this for a year? Um, I know President Kumar just told you I was chair for 11 years. So she said, could you do this for a year? Um, you know, as we're looking for a new chair. Uh, and oh, by the way, you know, can you take care of ABAT? <laughs> my, my timing was never great when you taking out administrative roles. Uh, I said, sure. Um, I did love my department, my colleagues, and I thought, uh, you know, it's, it's my time to do some service for my department. Um, but, you know, inside, uh, not a confession time, I was worried. Uh, when ABET, this organization, comes uh, and evaluates a the curriculum, they don't just look at what kind of course you should teach. They also look at staffing. They also look at the health of the faculty. Do you have enough faculty advice or students you have? Because they know that that is an important part of someone's education in engineering, having you know, resources, faculty, lab space, the quality of instruction, how you assess students' outcomes and performance. Those are all important things that all require faculty time. And if you don't have enough faculty, that can be sometimes a concern. They especially get curious when there's an interim chair. They start wondering, why is an interim chair here rather than a permanent chair? What is happening? Sometimes there are good reasons for this, but they will ask those questions. So I was a bit, a bit worried. Um, fortunately for me, I had an ace in the hole, uh, which was our students. Part of the program of a visit from ABET involves interviewing students. They want to see the product. Ultimately, we are judged based on how well our students are learning and how well they do what they have learned. So I invited Mike uh, to join us for the interview. Uh, so we had the lunch table together, Mike, the program evaluator, me, some other faculty, and some other students and alumni. And as often happens when older people have a lunch with younger people, naturally the question is, what do you want to do after you graduate? This is something that students, you would probably hear uh, at some point, perhaps too soon, but at some point as you're moving to your college career. So that can be an innocent question, but it can be a telling question. It kind of reveals something about how you approach life and how you see what your education means to you. And I had a pretty good idea that the ABED visitors' questions are not necessarily innocuous. Um, I need not have worried. Mike shared that he would like to go to grad school and then work at a small business. He explained that his immigrant father ran a small business and admired the closeness his father had in a small business with his employees. It's worth noting that this ABA visit occurred uh, shortly after the 2008 financial crisis and the country was still recovering from a very, very rough recession. Mike very movingly told about how his father spent nights worrying how he's gonna keep his company together and how he would try to do everything he can to keep as many of his employees employed because he knew that it'd be tough for them to find jobs in that kind of economy. Mike said what he wants to do with a tough education is to be in a place where he can do something similar for the people he works with. So that, I think, made an impact on the AVID visitor. So when we are debriefing um, the visit, he had a blunt sort of feedback to me. He said, you know, I was worried about you guys. <laughs> There's an interim chair, you. Uh, I didn't take any offense by that. Um, and I kind of was worried about your staffing, which I said I knew it. But you students are awesome. That's something good here. I recommend you have full accreditation. I see you in six years. So Mike saved the day. And it's because not necessarily how smart he was, although he was very smart, uh, how well his classes uh, were going. It was because he, the visitor felt that we had a disposition of students who would think about other things besides doing well for themselves. So I learned something that day, which is that you, the parents, are the heroes and the role models of our students, and that the students are our role models. It was a humbling experience, but very, very meaningful to me as a faculty member.
I'm going to move on to some stories about faculty colleagues. And this one's going to be a bit tough for me, so I have to excuse myself if I uh, uh, do get a bit emotional because it is a dear colleague of mine who passed away not too long ago. So this is by Miretta. Um, first, I'll talk a bit about sort of her accomplishments to set the context a bit. So uh, Miretta is an amazing scientist, uh, probably one of the best scientists that I've had personal interactions with. Um, and she's won a number of accolades, national, international, uh, member of the National Academy of Engineering. And uh, she's best known for her uh, development of what we call single atom alloy catalysts. Uh, catalysts, uh, you know, I think materials that, whether we know it or not, uh, around us everywhere. Uh, if you drive a car, a more conventional internal combustion engine, your car has one, it's called a catalytic converter. It's what uh, allows us to not emit as many harmful gases into the atmosphere because it'll take some of those noxious gases that result from combustion of fuel, gasoline fuel, and make them less harmful, something more benign like water, vapor, and then uh, CO and CO2. Not that they're completely benign, but at least they're not causing acid rain. Those are catalysts, and there are catalysts you know, everywhere around us. Um, one of the important things we need to do as we try to have a more sustainable world is for us to make materials and chemicals in a safer, more efficient way that leads to a smaller carbon footprint because there's less energy being used, less waste products being produced. And that's what catalysts allow us to do. They can make reactions go at a lower temperature and more efficiently uh, and with less waste production on the side. It turns out catalysts are actually pretty expensive because they need to be uh, reliant on precious metals like platinum. Uh, those metals have particular properties that are very beneficial for catalyzing chemical reactions at industrial scale, but of course, they're difficult to mine and obtain and pretty expensive, which means that people will not use these technologies that are just too expensive and not economy viable. One of the ways to make catalysts more viable is actually to disperse the atoms that are the precious atoms onto a larger support structure so that you use as little of the precious metal as possible. So that's what Mirada's research has shown over many decades. Uh, she's really recognized as her seminal contribution to the world of chemistry and chemical engineering by developing those uh, arrangements of atoms in space, if you will, that give those materials unique properties of being catalytically efficient, yet relatively cheap. She's an incredibly creative person. Um, I just remember she could just look at the periodic table, have all those elements on her head and arrange them every which way to come up with configurations. I think some people are just born with a gift of looking at the periodic table that way. I wish I had that, but that, that was Miretta's uh, a profound gift. The other gift she had and shared with the rest of us was uh, uh, her dedication to students. So um, one of the last conversations I had with her on the phone, well, even though I didn't know at the time, was, it was going to be one of the last ones I had with her, um, was when she was in the hospital getting treatment. And uh, almost the, the last thing we talked about was, I hope my students are okay. Um, She's been, you know, I was one of the few people in the department to know uh, what she was going through. She didn't want to burden her students. Um, I think she's really almost thought of herself as a mother, a second mother to her students. Uh, so she told me, but she hasn't told the group that she was uh, uh, going through an illness. So she was expressing concern about her students. And, you know, I feel bad that I'm not around so much for them to guide them. But she kind of perked up and said, but, you know, I just talked to George, one of our students. Meng Yao, the other student, and I gave them some really good directions. I think they got some good plans and they're gonna be productive. I think they should be okay. But can you please check up on them? Um, because you know, I'm not around. So that probably was the last time I talked to her in voice, in person, over the, after that we changed emails. Um, I didn't know that was the last time I was gonna speak to her. So that was really, the, I think, the very last memory of Miretta. <laughs> Sorry. And it shows me that this was someone who's just devoted not only to the science that she does, which is incredible science, but also the students she mentors. So um, that takes me to Charlie, and I'm gonna perhaps about a funnier note on, on what I just shared. Um, 
when Mirada passed away, of course, the students were devastated. You know, obviously they lost someone they were very close to, but they were not yet done. And for PhD students, having an advisor is probably the most important thing because you do need someone to guide you and eventually approve your doctoral thesis. Otherwise, all the years you put towards that, piece, that goal really not, will not come to fruition. <clears throat> so as the chair of the department, I need to find us students another advisor. And so I thought, you know, there's no better person than Charlie Sykes, a colleague in chemistry. I didn't know him that well. In fact, we never worked closely together because we were in very different areas of chemical engineering and chemistry. But uh, I knew Charlie by reputation. Mirada had spoken very highly of him. And, and Charlie uh, someone, is someone who is very knowledgeable about the field that Mirada students are working in because he's a, he's a chemist, he's a surface chemist. He also gets the periodic table in a way that I don't get. Uh, I figured Charlie is the right guy, uh, but I really had nothing to offer him other than saying thank you. Uh, Charlie, would you like to take on these additional students who are not yours? Uh, spend your time and resources to educate them, and I got nothing to offer you. <laughs> so I was a little bit nervous about making the ask. Uh, we got together for beer at Semolina, uh, in case you don't know where that is, that's on campus, it's great, they're good beers, local beers, um, if you're old enough to drink, that is, of course. <laughs> so we got together for beer, and uh, I said, hey, Charlie, could, would, you, would you do this for, 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 for me? And he said, yeah, of course, I'd be happy to. I was surprised, if there are very possible answers. I had to ask him, I was like, why? He had a very simple answer. I care about these students, I know them, and Mirella would do the same for me. So that was another moment when I realized that it's not just the impact we have on the students, it's the students who give us the relationship with each other to be able to do things with our colleagues. And here in the picture you see, um, it's unfortunate because everyone's masked, but uh, those two students, George and Mengyal, they graduated on time, have flourishing careers as a scientist, academic and industry. That's Charlie in the middle of the mask. And I was so proud of them. And I was so happy for them and Mirada and Charlie. I have another example of um, the story to share with you. The last one is more about uh, someone's relationship with their own student. And I picked this example because I found a picture of him getting an award in the backdrop, you see words like caring, kind, leader, listener. And this is my colleague, Professor Panzer, who actually is co-teaching a class with me right now, a freshman introductory class in coffee engineering. And uh, let me tell you, teaching a class with Professor Panzer uh, humbles you because you just sort of see how someone's way better at your job than you are. <laughs> Not only is he a better teacher than me, you know, seriously, um, his teaching evaluation average was a five. Somebody asked me, what was the standard deviation? <laughs> I looked at it, you know, it's five. <laughs> it's on a five point scale. There is no standard deviation. I know of no other colleague who actually has that uniform level of response from students. Anyway, let me read you what his student uh, wrote about him in a, in a nomination for teaching work, which he got, of course. Um, it was during my second semester in Professor Panzer's lab that I first experienced his compassion and concern as an advisor, as well as a co colleague. I was facing a tragedy with a sudden passing away of a close friend and was taking it toll on me emotionally. My productivity in the lab was being negatively affected for about two weeks or so. Instead of Professor Panzer calling me into his office to discipline me for my lack of work, he stopped by my cubicle to ask me if I would like to join him in grabbing a cup of coffee. He likes coffee. While walking to the coffee shop, Professor Panzer began to politely ask me how I was handling the situation. He offered up a few words, advice, while letting me know that he was always available if I ever needed to talk. That sentiment alone gave me a breath of fresh air in a situation where on most days, I was too overwhelmed to even get out of bed. It was the fact that I now wasn't completely alone 
in the situation. I had someone at work that could understand and sympathize with me. Professor Panda's response to the situation is absolutely exemplary of the type of advisor and mentor he is to all his students. He puts the needs of his students in front of his own in order to see us grow and mature into respectable researchers. And for that, he deserves to be recognized for this award, as this is a trait that all professors should strive to embody. Having worked with Matt, I also that some of the qualities mentioned is kind, caring, applies to us, his colleagues. And this is, to me, one of the secret sauces that makes Tufts special. Being a student-centered university doesn't necessarily mean it's something we do for the students. We attract the kind of people who care about other people because they care about students and they make also great colleagues. And it's really the culture of this institution that is ground in a center on students that benefits all of us who work here, makes a special place. So my very last story, I'm looking at my time, um, hopefully I'm not about to be cut off. <laughs> um, I will share one last story about a, uh, my own PhD student, uh, Ryan, who graduated many years ago, so as you can tell, this thesis is dated from May 2011. <clears throat> so, one of the, I think, side takeaways I have for you is that if you ever come across, uh, I realize this is not common bedtime reading, but if you ever pick up a, a PhD dissertation in a library, I encourage you to read the acknowledgement section. It says a lot about the people who did the science being reported in a doctoral dissertation. And sometimes that can be most rewarding to read than the science itself. So let me read you an excerpt from Ryan's uh, acknowledgement. Um, it's gonna sound like self-congratulatory because it's addressed to me, but <laughs> you, hopefully you'll bear with me. There's a point to this. Uh, yeah, first and foremost, I would like to thank Professor Lee. Thank you for always supporting me. Thank you for always treating me with respect. You have been an extraordinary advisor, mentor, role model, and friend. I appreciate you providing me with the assistance when I need it and giving me the freedom to explore on my own. I have always valued our discussions. I never left a meeting with you without feeling excited and optimistic about the future directions of our research. I have learned so much from you through the years, both intellectually and personally. You're one of the people in my life for whom I hold the utmost respect, and I thank you for setting such a wonderful example for me and other students. I will certainly miss our regular meetings, but I hope that our conversations will never end. It's difficult to describe how rewarding reading this is for me, but they're also reminded that I too had the capacity and on some occasions did my part to make someone's life here transformative. And also takes me full circle to the interaction I had with my advisor. Our relationships endure. The conversations never end. This is one of the very special parts of being an advisor at a university um, because we get to forge these special relationships. And I think Tufts is a special place because it really lifts up these relationships and makes them an important part of our lives and is really valued here. So after a lot of meandering, here's my very brief conclusion for you. And this is now directed to the students in the audience. I began my address to you talking about the expectations we have for a transformative experience. My conclusion is as follows. You are the agents of transformation. You can transform the lives of your friends, classmates, and professors through your actions and words, whether in the present or an acknowledgement section. I encourage you to expect this of yourselves. As you think about your next several years at Tufts, please set as a goal to seize the opportunity when you can to inspire somebody else who is part of this community. When you look back on your time at Tufts, it is my hope that you will measure your success here by having inspired one more person to do the very best in them and to reach for the very best and so that they can in turn inspire somebody else. Pax Elux, thank you.